Should we start, uh, Radias when, or Mamo? Are we? You just tell me when to kick it off. One moment. I'm One trying moment. to live stream. So once it starts, we'll, we can ah. start. Yeah. Okay. Oh, you, you need you need my consent. I can see. You hereby <laughs> have it. <laughs> Lots of new I things think... going on here. <laughs> <laughs> you can start now. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So. Good morning, afternoon. Hello, everybody from Copenhagen. My name is Margarete Holm Andersen, and uh, mm. I'm delighted to be here today with you all. Uh, I have been asked by Mamo to chair this session today, which is part of the, the series about putting Africa first, uh, revisited. Uh, Mamo is taking a great initiative here. Um, I've been working with Mamo. Uh, Bengdog Net and Kingiri, Rebecca Handlin, and many other scholars in the Global X community since I joined the university again in 2013 after having been away for many years and working within Practical Development Corporation in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and so on. Um, I joined primarily because Bengdog wanted me to, to join and, and come and work with the Africa League development of the Africa League network. Uh, but I also um, then started working within the IC group uh, and supporting uh, different Global X activities because the Global X Secretariat was at the time hosted by Aalborg University. I should say I have not had the privilege to neither know or work with Chris Freeman, but I was educated in the 1980s at Aalborg University, exactly when, when he was, he was uh, not exactly when he was there, but in the time, in that period. And as some of you know, Aalborg University was actually established as a, a part of a regional development strategy. Uh, the region at the time was suffering from a lot of outsourcing of uh, productive activities, so factories were closing down, there was unemployment and so on. And um, there was a need for, uh, in, and in this situation, you could say that the call for a knowledge-based economy actually came in quite uh, uh, importantly to try to, to change the, the processes at the time in the region. Um, so the university has traditionally had strong links uh, to the industry and to other actors in Northern Jutland on regional development and innovation issues and today also plays a role in the, in the regional uh, development. Our program today will take point of departure in part three of the book, um, Putting Africa First, which was issued in 2003 after Mamo had uh, been at Aalborg University for quite some time. And there was a conference that led up to the development of the book as, as you all know. The four chapters in the part three of the book are dealing with issues such as the differences in national uh, R&D systems, the uh, national innovation system concept and usefulness in studies in African countries by uh, Abdel Kada and others, the prospects of regional innovation systems in uh, South in uh, in um, southern uh, Africa, south of Sahara, and finally, uh, innovation systems and um, and other uh, endogenous uh, development issues. So these are the issues that we uh, have at at uh, at hand. Uh, for or these are the, the four chapters that are um, that are. Um, forming part of the background uh, for this. And I think I agree with the, with Mamo and with the organizers of this uh, seminar series that the book has actually not really been sufficiently read and used, but uh, here it is at least, so it, it exists. <laughs> and um, it's a good, uh, Mamo, I think it is a really good source uh, still for a lot of the discussions that we that uh, are necessary on African uh, on development issues, not just in Africa but across the board. So I've really enjoyed going back to it in this context here. We have a lot of speakers today, so I should stop talking and uh, and start introducing who we have. Um, and uh, the first speaker today is uh, Stephen E. Little. Um, and Stephen, you are a professor extraordinaire in the Department of Industrial Engineering at Swane University, right? Um, I'm sure you could say a lot more about yourself, <laughs> uh, but uh, we very much uh, look forward uh, to, to having you here and thanks for taking time to present. Um, we have uh, agreed that you will talk about uh, your, under the headline from super regional to hyper local, the 21st century scales of connectivity. So we are excited if, to hear about you uh, from you. So please, over to you.
and welcome to those of you that have joined. Are you able to share your slides, Stephen? Uh, you're muted right now. I, I should be, I did previously. Uh, Super. Oh, what's happening, is that? Uh, oh, still saying co-host. Uh, Hi, Zeke, welcome. Um, Doesn't um, it doesn't hang on. Can control. you send them to to me or to Radesh? Uh, so I can do. Is it? I, I was sharing earlier, but we were checking, so I'm not sure. Hmm. I'm... Radesh, do you need to give rights again? No, muted. he's already given the rights. He can okay. share it now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hang on. Ah, right. ah, here we are. Okay. Here we go. Right. Fine. Um, let's get this up. Uh, Can you go for a okay, screen? Okay, fine. Is that uh, okay? Fine. Uh, I'll go quickly through the first part of the presentation because it's really setting out what I think most of us know about the way that the global economy has developed in the since the uh, second half of the twentieth century. Uh, so. Certainly, I worked in Australia for 10 years, and it was very much an understanding uh, in that country that we had successive waves of investment that really ended up with three major uh, focal points for the global economy in uh, Northeast Asia, North America, Western Europe. And that meant that a, a great proportion of, of, of humanity were, were excluded from that process. Um, but also the old model of the, the core economies drawing in resources from the rest of the world, putting out goods and services, had been undermined into a much more complex uh, flows, certainly between the elements of, of, of this triad, but also in, into other areas. And inward investors were able to relocate their activities in a very different fashion, a much more complex fashion. And at the same time, uh, the differences between the central economies and the peripheral economies obviously were very great, but within individual nation states, very often those differences within regions and areas were as significant. And for any region unable to connect into this system, it's very difficult to maintain even modest economic activity. Um, and at the same time, the freestanding sovereign national state has been quite a short lived phenomenon. It, came out of 18th century Europe, but the way that we understand it at present is really a result of the two world wars of, uh, of the 20th century, uh, which also gave us super level, uh, supranational levels of accountability for both governments and individuals, so that the activities of the state are constrained um, quite significantly, not least because of the need to make associations in, into this economy. At the same time, within the state, we see in federal states very often there are conflicting uh, policies. In, for example, it's sometimes said the US has 50 different foreign direct investment policies, one for each state, and that's true of many other countries. So there can be tensions within the state um, and tensions between states. Um, and for developing uh, regional policies, again, there's, there's another form of tension because the, the logic of is to build on your strengths in order to participate in this system. And so, for example, in Europe, we have the European research area, the pursuit of global excellence in, in undertaking research and development, but at the same time, a set of policies, particularly directed at newer member states, of trying to sustain social cohesion and inclusion into a, a more balanced form of development. And typically in the United Kingdom, this translates into a golden triangle of London, Oxford and Cambridge that receives very much the lion's share of resources. And the problem within states is that the most development regions draw down the skills from the less developed areas. And very often in developing countries, that's the case of, of, of the largest or the capital city and region drawing in resources and making development in other areas much more difficult. Um, so oh, oh my writing in, in the 90s talked about the zebra strategy of, of playing to your relative strength of your most developed co component of your economy. And, and that's been seen in a number of 
cross-border regional synergies between, for example, Singapore and Malaysia, interestingly across the Taiwan Straits between Taiwan and the Republic of China, despite political differences, very strong economic links there. Um, but this sort of focus leaves you open to cherry picking by inward investors only going to the, to the most advanced regions. And again, it is a threat to political and, and social cohesion. The other sort of step change from complexity is also scale. And when people talk about, in the example of China, it's easy to forget the scale at which we're talking. So if we look at the Pearl River Delta region, which is some 55 million people, and I have this same slide with EU member states instead of African countries, you find enough. Uh, Stephen, sorry, you're muted. You're, you're, Stephen, you have yeah. muted yourself. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Yes, you're warning. back. Yeah. You're back. Now. Okay. So, I mean, most people might have heard, obviously, of Hong Kong, Macau, Guangzhou, or Canton, maybe Shenzhen, but these other cities, which are populations of equivalent to the, you know, member states of, of, the, of the African Union or the European Union, uh, perhaps few people have heard of. What we're also dealing with is a very well resourced, um, integrated region with a, a single language and culture. Um, a very powerful competitor. Um, one of the interesting responses from the European Union uh, has been to look into regional strategies and transnational regions, including, for example, looking at the Danube uh, as a region, including countries that are not actually member states, even, for example, parts of Ukraine and, and Moldova. Um, Within the, the European Union, we have the Baltic Sea region, again, a, a, a regional development program, which takes in, into what uh, Della made writing in, in, the, in the 90s identified as, uh, uh, if you like, the remnants of that, the Hanseatic League, uh, um, a sort of early modern uh, trading federation. Um, so there's an echo in, in the post-Cold War period where these states would have been divided by, by the you know, um, ideology of, of recovering earlier associations. And I think that's an important note to make in regard to Africa and, and uh, post-colonial development. Um, at a smaller scale, we have the cross-border region, for example, here in Orisund. I was involved with Region Skåne on, on, the, on the Swedish side of this equation uh, a few years ago, looking at how to develop the identity for this region. But this one, while it's built around some very um, high quality uh, science base, um, was, was victim of, of the pressures most recently of the pandemic closing uh, the links across the Orison Bridge that ties the thing together, but also the pressure from uh, refugee migration, which led to the introduction of, of border checks, even though it's within the Schengen zone. So there are externalities that in interfere with these policies. Um, also, some regions, potentially a Southern North Sea region, didn't, didn't get support from the European Union. Um, and at the same time, an area which has strong potential um, falls foul of contestation. And here's a map showing already a contestation between neighboring states interpreting uh, international law in relation to who has what part of this uh, of the South China Sea. And, and the red line shows China coming in with their own interpretation saying, well, most of this is ours historically and, and so forth. So there are complexities and difficulties in, in these, but on a, on a positive note, um, one of my PhD students at, at, at the University of Bolton in the UK is, is looking into this Indonesia, Malay, Thailand growth triangle, where these are lagging regions, which in the past have been closely linked through religion, geographical proximity, and cultural linguistic ties, and making a genuine attempt to, to bring about a cross-border synergy, which isn't driven uh, by, by external forces. Um, inevitably, for, uh, for countries, there, there are risks and rewards of, of participating in this system, and the the, the potential of brain drain is also the potential of brain circulation and while losing people to the di diaspora is, brings remittance that remittance can be not just financial but also intellectual and we've seen government policies now for getting on for 20 years in india and china to get re the return of people with overseas experience the modern communications including what we're using today of course allow points of presence virtually and directly we have Chinese and Indian enclaves within Silicon Valley where access to resources, not least the, the 
the, the venture capital finance. Um, and I think through this pandemic, and, and I'm sure other people will make the comment, we've had a very rapid acceleration of the adoption of the key technologies and practices that, that are possible. Um, and it's the sort of social learning through this interaction which is key to this. Um, understanding the technology gives you measurable efficiency objectives, but a longer term understanding of how you might redefine organizational structures and objectives and relationships comes out of the, the social learning. So as people move along a value train towards higher value added activities, and in a context where the distinction between products and services is eroding, uh, uh, for example, leasing aero engines instead of buying them and paying for the, for the performance and, and not the capital investment, also brings about the concept of localization as more adjustment to, to the cultural variation amongst end users and customers. And this is where local engagement can actually add value. Um, so for smaller players, um, the question is how, how can you have input into the, the, the way that it, this techno-economic paradigm might be developing? And going back some, getting on for 35 odd years and visiting the MIT Media Lab, it was full of off-the-shelf equipment that people were playing with in ways that the people who manufactured it hadn't thought of. We had the phenomenon in the 90s of uh, people called road warriors in the States festooned with uh, cell phones and laptops and so forth, um, basically uh, attempting to create what, you know, we all have in a, a single device in our pockets today. They were kind of preempting the technical development. They were doing their social learning ahead of the availability of that technology. Um, the problem is, of course, that as the most developed regions push forward, they start to raise the, the entry level of infrastructure requirements, they promote rapid technological obsolescence. And that's why regional innovation systems are important in defining the appropriate development pathways for particular areas and not having to tag along behind the external set of priorities. So the modern technology, and I'm sure other, other speakers will touch on these, give us the opportunity to move towards a, a, a distributed open innovation approach. And um, taking Williamson's idea of, of the transaction organization is a move from management to governance and Raymond writing about um, the model of Microsoft versus the Open System Foundation and Linux, titled his book, The Cathedral and the Bazaar. So instead of a, an information hierarchy of distribution, knowledge sharing a distributed community of practice developing the, you know, the, the Linux resources. And I think this is an interesting model to think about. Um, now the hyper-local side of things um, really stems from what's been going on in the, in the region I live in, which is Northwest England, which has got a very strong economy and very diverse in, in both high technology and creative sectors. And the contest, did, EU referendum result was very striking because the major cities within the region were voting to remain in the European Union, whereas adjacent areas were voting to leave. And subsequent changes um, initially didn't seem to have made much impact on, on politics. The following year, the mayoral election was in Manchester was fairly ran to form. But in the next local elections, we began to see hyper-local separatist parties who didn't just want to leave Europe, they wanted to leave the boroughs within Greater Manchester. And then in the most recent general election, a collapse of very traditional uh, Labour Party seats on the basis of finishing the Brexit process. Get Brexit done was basically the only policy the government proposed. Um, and this was the outcome of very long-term disillusion and shifts in allegiance, which really goes back to some 40 years of neoliberalism. But Strikingly, looking at the 10 boroughs that make up Greater Manchester is the three southerly boroughs that voted remain. And within those, that, for example, Trafford, where I live, was more, more uh, leave in the north, remain in the south. And this is about the connectivity down to London, down to other parts of the country, rail and air, air connections. Um, and one of the local MPs picked the, this town versus cities tension within the region. Um, and the quote here when somebody's saying, you know, <clears throat> we're 
one of the 10 boroughs Bolton, we're moulded into Bolton, the sign says, welcome to Bolton, it should say, welcome to Farnworth. People's very local identity, I think, is a refuge against the, the, you know, the pressures of, of, that they find themselves under. And so we see literally very hyper-local parties in an area where traditionally turnout has been as low as 10%, pursuing uh, a separatist agenda as a response to um, their feelings about globalization and loss of investment. Um, so we have to look for ways, how do we re reconnect with these communities which are, th are that alienated for, uh, from what many of us would regard as the, the mainstream. And we really have to look at the differential experience at, at, at the different scales. Um, the knowledge-based economies make different demands that there's a change in economic landscape, which if we're going to manage, we have to look at historical path dependencies as to how places got to where they are. And very often there's a very strong sense of pride in that past, not only about the skills and traditions that came from that can also be repurposed into, into new industries, into green transitions and so forth. Um, and at, at the same time, the very technologies that, that, that have driven the, the globalization sort of top down can, can be repurposed in ways I indicated earlier. A, a new bottom up network uh, paradigm response, I think is possible. Um, so the people who perhaps in the past felt they were passive recipients of change can actually start to, to re-engage. And again, I think the, the pandemic has forced through a lot of changes that might have taken longer to do. Um, and, and the remedy, I think, is in appreciating the difference and richness of, of different identity. And we worked around with colleagues on both place branding and, and tourism development. And tourism, not just as a, an economic activity to draw in resources, but tourism as a, as a means of celebrating and, and differentiating uh, a, a location to, to plug into the contemporary culture, whether it's youth culture or high culture, but also in the, the traditional pathways. Um, which always brings on it this touristic danger of maybe commodification and again, sub-optimizing uh, an offer which is simply competing with your neighbors, but to really dig in and get something which is distinctive. Um, and just to finish, I think an interesting comment at the end of the 2019 Regions Week in Brussels from the Director General for Region and Urban Policy, where he gave a talk contrasting nationalism, which is bad, with patriotism, which is good. And I think the patriotism he was talking about was that very strong local identification and, and, and sensibility rather than a kind of imposed, imagine community nationalism top down. Um, and from that, I think the literature on, on, on place and country branding is um, very useful in this respect. And I in many ways, I think that the hyperlocalism, rather than being a, th a threat to um, broader sensibilities, might be part of the antidote to a top-down nationalism that people don't really engage with. And I'll finish at that point because I think I'm. Uh... Thank you very, very much, Stephen, for for that very interesting uh, presentation. I I think it uh, raises a lot of of good issues. And you mentioned in your presentation the. Um, the uh, Urson region, which is, uh, yes. <laughs> of course, uh, almost the the contrast to to Northern Jutland. So uh, yeah, well, I, uh, yeah, I mean, I've, I've visited Arbor a couple of times. I've uh, yeah. read yeah, yeah. and worked there for a while. And, uh, but I think also, I think what's interesting, without going into detail, I think interesting that now we have Greater Copenhagen, which is a, a, yeah. a competing brand within that region. So yeah, 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 there yeah, are yeah. tensions. No. And, lots uh, of uh, lots of tensions you know, going on. I think on. there's a lot of very uh, riches. I think in, in, in a way that sort of contest, it's a bit like local you know, rival football teams in, in yeah. a city. Yes, yeah. <laughs> completely. It can be a source of conflict, but it can also be a source of energy. So, uh, <laughs> Definitely, yeah. But, but I, I also think... Mm -hmm. Yeah, as I say, that's a quick overview, but I'm, I'm aware that a number of the other speakers are going to drill down yeah. in some of those areas that I covered yeah. in a lot more detail. Right. Yeah. Right. So um, I think uh, without uh, much further ado, I will give the floor to the next speaker then, who is uh, Raja uh, Rasia, a distinguished professor of economics at the Asian European Institute, University of Malaysia. Oh, Malaya. And he uh, obtained his doctorate in economics from Cambridge University in 1992. 
and has been a Robert Yali, uh, Robert Yali fellow at Harvard University and um, many among many other big achievements. So Radia, yeah, thanks a lot for taking time to present to us and engage with us today. We look forward to your presentation. Can you, you see my screen, Margaret? Yes, yes, we can see it perfectly clear, okay, but maybe you. Uh, maybe you want to enlarge it to make it- uh, Can it, is it visible? Because I haven't got a clock to time myself. If it's visible, I would prefer- Okay, to just keep it like this. That's fine. Very visible. Okay. Yeah. It's very visible, okay. yes. Yeah. Thank you. I, I was told to speak on the four chapters that are there, and you mentioned them in the, in the book, uh, the first by Alice Amston. And let me go straight there. Um, <clears throat> the main arguments, I believe, uh, by Alice Amston and Cho, I, I think Dr. Robert Alice, of course, she passed on. Differences in R&D approaches between Korea and Taiwan uh, and others. This is the, the notion she expounds whether the focus should be on, on national capital or foreign capital. Her preference is that countries evolve and for them to have the uh, ability to catch up. She actually pro promotes the uh, national capital. In the interest of time, let me just go on to the next one. <clears throat> Abdul Kadir, the flood, of course, uh, uh, discusses the Maghreb countries, and then he says that uh, the levels of R&D investment and, and, of course, patent take up extremely low compared to the developed countries that he's got in comparison. And then, of course, uh, Mario Scarry, uh, I don't really know him in person. I hope he's here now listening. Consider Sub Saharan Africa to be too poor to support NIS and recommends instead regional innovation systems. <coughs> You're looking at several countries rather than what Margaret um, mentioned just now about regional innovation systems within Denmark, say, uh, the focus on Olberg and perhaps uh, Skagen and, and places nearby. Then uh, Shulin Gu, uh, whom I, have, of course, interacted quite a lot with, considers uh, government support in East Asia crucial and takes the Danny Roderick argument on strengthening institutions to stimulate it. My, my own impressions are all of them have strengths, yes, uh, because Mario's work really talks about the fact that these countries are just simply too poor. He somehow feels that they haven't got the resources to support uh, uh, the buildup of national innovation systems. Or for that matter, Amston just wants to make a point. In fact, she has subsequent work too with uh, Ted Chung, making the case that much of what R&D is done by FDI abroad are really frontier R&D. Um, and then the case truly, I suppose she should have, at least I feel, uh, looked at how Roderick defines uh, institutions. To some extent, I wasn't uh, convinced with both uh, Roderick's and uh, Darren Asamoglu's notion of institutions, because to me, they seem to collide with our own exponents like uh, Dick Nelson and others, or even the, the new institutional economists like Ronald Coase, Williamson, or, or Douglas North. If there are questions, I'll come back to that. Now, what I saw in Chris Freeman's work, uh, I mean, apart from the fact that he's such a passionate Humble, humble guy, um, a strong focus on NIS. In fact, my early readings, I'm not sure if there were others who actually detailed this, I think Chris Freeman puts it up very clearly in the early 80s, and then especially his work in 1985 in Japan. Uh, beyond promotional and screening, uh, which is what Thomas Johnson discussed in the Miti and the Japanese Miracle Shield, he also included a focus on R&D organizations, universities, and innovation support organizations. Um, the, and for me, of course, it's the first of its kind. Learning and innovation as having a cumulative path dependent and system um, elements in there, in, a, in, in some sense, in a Marshallian sense, although, of course, the notion of systemic in Marshall is different from how uh, I prefer the one that uh, Chris articulates. Critical role of adaptations and locating new product and process development, a lot of it, and I reviewed this for a journal. Uh, uh, she was a student of uh, Chris Freeman, Yukiko Fukasaku. Uh, and then, of course, policy issues that he brings up, also mentioned and in, the, in the triangulated sort of empirical oral history that Fukasaku used to explain how Japan won the second, uh, um, uh, the, the Russo-Japanese war, uh, having uh, tankers and so on. One will get that sort of a picture uh, uh, presented very well uh, with all those little, little pieces of information. <clears throat> Now, let me go to the next, next slide, locating Sub-Saharan Africa in the globalization process. My own feeling, unfortunately, is the, I mean, I want to put it here. I'm, I hope the screw school guys are here. For some reason, I felt Jorge Cass articulation of uh, 
effective coordination between micro and macro, uh, the macro economy and the macro economy wasn't properly, so perhaps he wasn't so articulate. Maybe they should have heard Jorge Ocampo presenting. In fact, there's a, there's a book on the Oxford uh, handbook, handbook of Industrial Policy to which we contributed. And I think that's, that's important in the sense that he actually, these guys explain why some countries end up not having the resources to support innovation systems in a way like um, uh, perhaps Ma Mario Scarry should have addressed these points. And then in that sense, you avoid the fallacy of competition problems. For me, all these neoclassical guys who have attacked that, to me, either the econometrics have not been robust, uh, or for that matter, they haven't understood the problem very well. It's almost like saying countries like Korea, Taiwan, and so on develop, but these countries avoided the fallacy of competition, um, uh, specializing in particular goods where terms of trade continue to fall over a long period of time. A lot of African countries are characterized by that. Now, it's not that they should not be doing that, but there should be ways of getting out of that problem. Otherwise, they'll be uh, facing a debt overhang, um, avoiding the Dutch disease problems. How, how for that, in that sense, uh, Holland overcame that? Many countries in Africa haven't been able to do that. And I haven't got that much time. Let me just move on to the next. Balance between FDI and national firms. I think Alice has a very strong point. Uh, she's on her own done, not just with Cho, which is, appears in the book. Um, she actually uh, combines these two in an 89 book, um, 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 Asia's Next Giant, South Korea and, and Late Industrialization. She even mentions how Park Chung-hee fixed the, the war against the dollar between 1974 and 79 when it was highly destabilizing. And at a the time they were highly reliant on imports when oil prices went up four times in, in the period 73 to 75. And of course, 79 to 80. Of course, you were short dead in 79, by security guard, but many things happened since. But I think these are important things to learn. And I think she has got a point because in my own empirical work on the semiconductor industry, and I, I bet, to, uh, bet, uh, uh, bet to challenge whoever has done that sort of empirical work visiting firms from end to end. Frontier research is not something that goes out of hand compared to what Amsterdam has often uh, worked on. <clears throat> now, in the, the two countries I feel which have done really well of late and have the capacity financially uh, to support innovation systems, provided their proper review mechanisms and so on, ensuring that if at all a roadmap has been established and that roadmap is continuously recalibrated, to take on random events, to take on changes in all sorts of other things. And the fact that firms continuously change and the fact that technologies do change. I think these two countries have been doing really well. Um, uh, Rwanda and Ethiopia, I, I think they've been doing really well. If only they are guided in the right sort of sense, it could be possible sub-Saharan Africa, not the whole of Africa as such, because countries like Tunisia, Egypt, Libya, um, Algeria, Morocco, they, they have more advanced systems than what well, you have in sub-Saharan Africa. I think they, this could be two good countries that could possibly defy and could possibly become uh, um, the starting points that could snowball to see sub-Saharan Africa develop with a strong innovation system. I'd like to stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Radia, for uh, giving us that. Um, a good uh, overview of the book chapters and uh, some of Chris Freeman's related arguments, as well as the trying to locate this all within the sub-Saharan uh, uh, context uh, discuss discussions. Uh, I believe that there will be many of the speakers uh, talking right after this that will uh, will now narrow in on the African issues. So uh, I want to um, to give the floor now to uh, Ned Lawrence, um, who is uh, both at, um, a professor of economics at the University of Nice, Sofia Antipolis, and assigned professor at the University of Aalborg. He's a member of the, um, the University of Côte d'Azur as well. I didn't know that. <laughs> but hi, Ned. Good to hear. Oh, let me um, just explain. Um... Yeah, the University of Nice changed its name recently after a merger oh. with other institutions in the region to the University of Cote d'Azur. So it includes uh, some of the major that's research fine. institutions on the technology part. So that's why it is. I'm also visited. I'm also distinguished visiting professor at University of Johannesburg. Yeah. Right. So, and um, we would actually uh, like to very much now hear from you. Uh, okay, please uh, go on with your presentation. You have promised that you would. Um, yeah, we, we've already talked a little bit about what you would be talking about. So over to you. 
Okay, thanks very much. And I, um, it's a pleasure to be here to have this opportunity to uh, participate in this event and to uh, work with MAMO again. Let me pull up the uh, slide I had. Can you see that? Is it? I think there might be a way to get it larger. I don't know. We can see the slides, but yes, it would okay. be good to get them a bit bigger if you can. Um, if I can do the little um, bottom. Is it this one down the bottom? Yes, yes, yes. You're right. Okay, thank you. Well, I just I um I'll I'll try to be brief, take up a few points that um relate a little bit to the things that have been interesting me in my research that were also um, addressed in the um, in the part three. Um, is that top of that being cut off, or is it just just for me? Um, anyway, there's four chapters, as you know, in the part three on the um, regional uh, dimensions, cross-regional experiences. There's a chapter, as um, Raj already mentioned, uh, uh, chapters by Abdel Kader and, uh, and uh, Sari focus uh, mostly on the characteristics of Af African innovation systems, Ab Abdel Kader specifically on the Maghreb countries. And Sari makes an argument more generally about um, the um, potential for regional innovation systems, given that he starts from the idea that the, um, the general of the weakness of uh, national um, innovation systems in most African countries. Absent and show mainly a comparative assessment of um, Asian newly industrializing economies and Shulingu considers policies um, that might be adoptable in African countries based from the lens of African NIES in, in, in industrializing countries. But she's very attentive to what should and should not be retained as a, um, a model for Africa. Uh, I think a common view that comes out in most of the um, to the extent that they you know, focus in on Africa is that there are these, uh, it seems as pertinent to me today as in the past, is that most African innovation systems display important institutional weaknesses. And in Advocate's chapter, he provides a de detailed empirical assessment of this for the Maghreb countries and focuses particularly on the linkages between the educational research systems on the one hand and their relationship to industry on the other. And as I mentioned, um, Sari's argument is that the basic requirements for establishing, uh, argues that the basic requirements for establishing a viable innovation systems are not present in most um, African countries. And I think there's a big emphasis there on um, capabilities and weak human capital. Um, I just, one, one thing that isn't, and I would, I think obviously there's, um, it couldn't have been anticipated, um, but that has had opened up some new possibilities for development, possibly even leapfrogging, is the uh, in the uh, the new digital technologies, and I'm thinking particularly um, the development of mobile telephone and mobile telephone infrastructure, and and um, in many African, most African countries, to varying degrees, of course, in place of um, costly investments in fixed line infrastructure. The increase in uh, internet use, um, access by uh, mobile phones, which dates basically 2000 and or 2003 on. The mobile money revolution starting in 2007 with M-Pesa in, um, in Kenya. Um, but in, in, I'll mention a more, a bit more about that later. The rise of um, indigenous, not they're all courses are threats, risks due to the um, large digital platforms coming from, from uh, developed countries, but there's a, and development of indigenous digital platforms, particularly in countries like Kenya and Nigeria, and actually uh, insight to impact a, um, an institution in um, Johannesburg has um, to study these and does a overview of what they are and their impacts. Uh, but more also the question of digital based enter entrepreneurship, use of things like social media. We talk a lot about things like um, we think of industry 4.0 as uh, AI and uh, robots, but there's a great use of uh, social media and the e-commerce kind of platforms by micro, even micro and small enterprises, including those in the um, informal economy. On the idea of there is some um, leapfrogging, but this is just a figure that shows the share, the proportion of internet access coming from mobile telephone communications across different regions of the world of countries. As you can see Kenya and Nigeria, tend to be, um, are in the lead and they're substantially higher than um, the average for the rest of the world. And um, you get these very high figures. 
which relate to the fact that um, back if you look at back at 2000, the um, the way these figures are usually presented is in terms of the number of subscriptions per 100 persons. So in terms of fixed line inter fixed line um, telephone subscriptions in um, sub-Saharan Africa, it was uh, only slightly over one per 100 persons in 2000, where in the high income countries it was already up to about 50. Um, in 2020, we find that um, in sub-Saharan Africa, the, um, the number of mobile subscriptions, um, what had increased from uh, like about zero, really close to zero in 2000 to um, over 75 per 100 in um, 2020. And in Kenya, which of course is, is quite um, um, relatively advanced in this, uh, over 100 um, mobile subscriptions for 100 persons, which is not that much below what it is in the um, high income countries. So there's been a real transformation in terms of um, tele telecommunications infrastructure being mobile based and the amount of um, access. Um, sorry. I just wanted to present, uh, it's good to have a few, I'm taking the opportunity just to present some of the results of a survey of micro and small firms that was conducted in Johannesburg in 2019, looking at um, part of some of the new technologies and innovation. And this is um, a sample of about 509 informal economy firms. You can see this a significant share, um, even in the micro area are using social media. Um, there is also a fair bit of use of um, having a website, though significantly more in the small compared to the micro level and um, using mobile phones to contact customers. These are some of the questions that were asked in the survey. And uh, does that matter? Well, not to bore you with the econometrics, but we did do a little regression looking at product innovation as it's measured standardly with the um, Community Innovation Survey Awesome Manual. And we find that for this sample, uh, which included um, a certain a smaller percentage of formal micro and small companies registered, that in fact is a positive impact of using social media and of um, internet surfing on product innovation. And social media is used both as a way to um, market, publicize your goods to uh, mostly local, local markets, but not exclusively. And, um, but also it becomes a source of gaining ideas, particularly internet surfing, you can get, get ideas for new products, new services, even looking overseas. So this is happening. Um, and I know one of our PhDs that um, has recently done a work, this is manufacturing on the services. And there's been a tremendous um, important increase in a number of these small um, uh, digital based um, companies that have popped up partly because of COVID. Yeah. So this and is, this I is just uh, interrupt well, you briefly to ask everybody to mute if they are, if, if, apart from you, to mute themselves okay. because there's a dog uh, trying to compete with you. <laughs> oh, okay. It could be outside outside my... Um, ah, okay. It may be true. I'm sorry okay. about that. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> just a couple of words about, because Sari talks about regional innovation systems. And um, of course, this has been on the agenda in the AU since the um, Abuja Treaty of 1991, which called for the integration of African economies in order to increase self-reliance, promote endogenous self-sustained development. And then when the um, Constitutive Act, uh, not Constitution, the Constitutive Act of the AU in 2000, that one of the fast track, the um, African Continental Free Trade Agreement and area, and um, it was, um, it's been on the AU's uh, agenda 2063 um, uh, as a flagship initiative. Well, as you probably know, there has been progress. Oh, first of all, what, what, why would this, uh, some of the reasons why this is often considered to be important is because if you look at the patterns of um, exports outside of, um, of African countries, uh, to Africa and those two developed countries into the world, you'll see that what, it, what, what um, many UNCTAD reports have pointed out is that the, um, if we use like say um, laws classification, they tend to be relatively weighted towards more sophisticated high value added products. So it looks like within, this could be extended, this would suggest that an extension of regional, because a very relatively small share of um, trade is within Africa 
uh, intra-African as opposed to ex external, if we compare with many other, most other regions of the world, uh, especially Europe, but also Asia. So there's this, this idea that particularly that regional value chains um, could be uh, a potential um, vehicle for upgrading and for having more of the high value added production that's currently tends to be the global value chains located in the developing countries could be then relocated within Africa. Okay, so this is the idea. This is part of the argument for um, developing a free trade um, area. And the point in being also that if you look at the global value chains, African countries on sub-Saharan Africa, particularly largely combined low value added upstream production, mainly primary inputs. So there's very limited scope um, for upgrading. And then the regional value chains could be particularly important, of course, in um, agro industry and in the areas where there's a natural resource abundance in many African countries. And so the idea this could also be a vehicle for, um, for the development of industry by looking at agro, agro industry as um, um, its, its, its scope potential for, for, um, for growth. So what has happened, uh, just quickly some of the, it, the um, Kigali Agreement in 2018, um, establishing the free trade area was signed by, has been signed by 54 countries, all but one. The objective was to have 90% free trade with limited exemptions for sensitive products, because there is obviously potential for this to be um, the benefits and the costs to be unequally distributed across sectors and countries. So there is that, that issue that has to be uh, dealt with and can partly be dealt with on um, um, rules of origin and um, other mechanisms that could possibly compensate for the where the losses are heavily concentrated. So it's now been ratified uh, by 38 countries as of August um, 20th of this year. And some of the first um, shipments under the free trade agreement have already occurred and are occurring. So there's been, um, a, I think, a rather remarkable capacity to come together on this in Africa. When um, if we look back at the situation in um, 2000, when the uh, Constitutive Act was um, uh, the AU took place and there was this uh, objective. It's actually um, the countries, many countries, most countries, 38, have moved forward to ratify it. And the, um, the free trade agreement is now starting. But it's obviously not enough. Um, and particularly if you think about the, the potential for losses in certain regions, what's really needed um, um, is a um, development-based integration, which, and that's, that's discussed, obviously, and indeed included in the, some discussion in the Kegel Agreement. But there has to be more um, um, investment and uh, development of infrastructure, because if we, we talk a lot about telecommunications as being as advanced, but transport and roads um, remains very weak, little progress in terms of um, the coverage of uh, paved roads and the transport systems. They haven't made much progress. Power and electricity, there are, of course, large gaps in rural areas. Some of them are being um, met in some countries through um, off-grid and then um, getting the, um, the benefits of, um, in case of East Africa, MCOPA, um, M-PESA, E-Money, e financing um, off-grid um, solar, solar panels, uh, home kits through the, um, through one's e-money accounts and mempes is, is something that's taking place. And then there are PETA programs, which, which, which have very ambitious goals for transport and electricity. But as I said, there needs to be um, vast amounts of investment, which there's a huge African Development Bank suggests um, a financing gap in the area of um, 68 to 108 billion dollars per year to begin to uh, uh, meet some of those infrastructural gaps, which are crucial. Um, and uh, they can't, whatever can be done with digital economy, you cannot transport agricultural products from rural areas to central city markets with, um, with, uh, with digital technology. You need roads, you need, um, you need uh, physical infrastructure to um, deal with uh, spoilage and preservation of goods and so on. There's a large investments that have to be made here in physical um, infrastructure. 
So there's also, a, and I think Rebecca will be talking more about this, but there is a continental strategy for education. And I'll be in my last few words, so I'm probably going over, um, which focuses on the need for, uh, it has a TVET, and I think Rebecca will be talking about that, it has a TVET component. And the point they're trying to make is that we should stop seeing TVET, that's this technical vocational education training as a refuge for those who failed in general education. There's too much of this idea that TVET is something that just takes place in high schools or in maybe even primary schools. Um, and that once we get on to being adults, it counts as universities. But you know, a learning organization, a learning organization which, um, in which all employees at all levels can contribute in terms of their knowledge, their their adaptability, their skills uh, requires training. Some of this training can be acquired through training on the job, and that, that is very important. Some of it will need more formal training through external providers. And um, so we need to begin to see that TVET is a complement to the investments in the skills of engineers and scientists, and that firms that are learning organizations um, need both. And I think actually Freeman talked about this because keep in mind when he talked about um, Japan, he didn't focus just on R&D and radical innovation. He focused on incremental innovation. And he made the point is the factory floor and the workshops are the locus in which innovation emerges in an incremental sense. And he thought that he saw this as being a key, po key part of what was taking place in Japan when he uh, visited. So I would say, give more attention to TVET to balance out the heavy focus on science and technology and engineering skills. And that's all I have to say. Thanks a lot, Ned. And although you. you went a bit over time, it was, uh, it was really <laughs> interesting to hear your your presentation here. Um, and there's uh, quite a lot going on in the chat as well. So uh, please uh, keep your questions coming uh, in the chat, and we'll try to get back to some of them at least in the in the discussion. Um, and um, I think that the these um, figures, there was also some figures from you, Mamo, on the inter-African trade uh, comprising only 10% as opposed to inter-Europe trade being up to 70%. I mean, I urge everybody to follow the, the, the chat as well as, you, as that can also inspire you. Um, but I do need now to give the floor to the next speaker who is uh, Swapan Kumar Patra. And uh, maybe you can start bringing up your slides while I just uh, say a little bit uh, about you. Uh, you are also at the Tswane University of Technology in Pretoria, um, South Africa, and uh, hold a PhD in science policy studies from School of Social Sciences at, at uh, Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi in India. And you work with globalization of R&D, multinational, uh, multinational enterprises and innovation systems. And I think today you will in particular be talking uh, about the literature growth in, in Africa, um, subject wise productivity and citation patterns of AU membership uh, member countries and the patenting activities of AU member countries. So it's over to you and you have approximately uh, 10 minutes, please. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Chair. Welcome. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for my uh, introduction. And I also like to thank uh, Professor Muchi and uh, Dr. Rajesh. They are very carefully organizing this uh, talk, very interesting talk. This is the fourth uh, in this session. And I was also initially involved uh, in organizing this, uh, this seminar, but now Rajesh is you know, uh, he's uh, very smoothly organizing these things. So I would like to thank him very much, as well as Professor Muchi. So I am just talking about some you know, quantitative uh, data, mainly on the science technology indicator. The title is Scientific and Technical Productivity of African Countries, what Scopus and WIPO patent scope data tell us. Can uh, you enlarge uh, your slides, please? Yeah, yeah. This is the... Yes, this is the title of the topic and we have also developed a paper along with Professor Muchi and we have sent this paper to the journal uh, Scientometrics and this uh, this research is under uh, review. Yes, I'm, I'm trying to make it a full screen. Uh, you were at the right place. Yeah, just, yeah, yeah. there you are. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. And um, yes. So uh, African continent, 
continent has taken uh, several strategies to develop the science technology and innovation uh, infrastructure in all all over the africa one of the most famous is the perhaps uh, this is the beginning that manrova strategy uh, in 1979 followed by the lagos plan of action in 1980 then the abuja treaty in 1991 the african continent has also established the african economic community and the adoption of the africa science technology consolidated plan of action by the african union in 19 in uh, 2007 in 2013 african union has uh, adopted the agenda 2063 in 2014 the eu has created a specific sectoral strategy on science technology and innovation by adopting 10 years science technology and innovation strategy for africa that is called satisa in 2024 the africa science technology consolidation plan of action has taken many initiative to map the ancient output of african union Uh, it has been come out african innovation outlook 2014 and it also come in the two three volume so in addition to this uh, uh, the different countries for example south africa has taken the national innovation policy in 1996 and also it has been uh, uh, it has been uh, uh, just it has been revised in 2018 so there is there is many initiative all over the continent but uh, it is not uh, giving that much of product so just uh, in our study we wanted to oh, sorry just we wanted to map the productivity in terms of uh, in terms of scientometrics uh, indicator uh these are the works previously has been done by many scholar many scholar for example uh, by neverias in 2000 to this study has observed that uh, many of the poorest african countries in the world are in the continent have their weak science and technology infrastructure uh, south africa is one of the uh, well, is among the african countries that has made the remarkable progress in terms of scientific publications with the establishment of new democratic government in 1994 there is also uh, several scholarly studies that map the first and reality of the various aspect of the scientific publications of the in south africa the subject wise bibliographic uh, study include the engineering research profile in south africa medical research and this kind of many scientometrics and the uh, you know bibliometric studies have been done uh, we have we are we have done all you know uh, the snt mapping of the whole continent using various bibliometric indicator as the analytical tool patent has been taken uh, to map the technological capability so these are the objective we try to map the scientific productivity of the african countries in terms of scientific publications we did citation analysis of the research productivity of the of various countries we also map the technological capability of the african countries in terms of patenting activity from the wipo world intellectual property uh, property office databases so the literature data is downloaded from the scopus database and this is the sci amago journal and country rank it is a portal based on the scopus database and uh, this shows the different kind of indicator for example literature growth year wise publication journal where the uh, most publication is coming out and so on from the wipo website we have downloaded the patent scope data for the, uh, the patent databases but this study has a kind of limitation because uh, all the scopus claim that it has covered the maximum uh, literature or scholarly databases but uh, it is mostly the developed country focus and uh, very few uh, africa literature has been uh, has been covered in the database so a kind of uh, africa centric africa centric uh, uh, citation databases is the need of our so the uh, the preliminary analysis of our uh, results shows that there is a significant growth of publications publications from the whole african continent from the 2000 onwards you can see here so there is exponential growth of publication but uh, the most interesting thing is that this publication cumulative growth of african continent publication is coming from this only two region that is the uh, uh, southern part southern africa uh, southern african countries and the northern african countries but overall there is a uh, visible growth of uh, scientific publication from the african countries 
if you can say the subject wise distribution of publication uh, it is uh, you know this uh, decreasing order medicine is one of the uh, one of the top most areas of publication followed by agriculture and biological sciences followed by engineering biochemistry and and so on and if you can see the citation analysis of uh, uh, african publication you can see that um, african uh, literature is quite well well cited it is uh, citation per paper is more than the average citation public asset uh, citation of asia and the western europe but it is below the world uh, total world uh, citation per paper and these are these are the uh, you know uh, reason why then citation matrix of the east uh, african countries i am not going into the details but uh, from the East African countries, Kenya ranks uh, in the top, but its global rank is uh, 67, followed by Ethiopia, Tanzania, Uganda, Zimbabwe, Malawi, and so on. Uh, next, in the Middle African countries, that is the worst performing in terms of the scientific publication from the African continent. Cameroon is the 85th uh, position, and Congo is 119, Gabon is 133, and so on. In the Northern African countries, Egypt is performing quite well. Perhaps uh, from the Northern part is the Egypt and the Southern part is South Africa. This is only the two per well performing country as it is reflected from the global citation databases. In the Southern African countries, South Africa is a global rank uh, uh, 34. And these are number of the prior publications. So I'm just quickly going through this. In the Western African region, it is the Nigeria followed by Ghana, Senegal, Ivory Coast, and Burkina Faso, and so on. And in terms of patent, uh, there is a growth. There is certainly a significant growth. But anyway, just uh, yeah, I'd like to say that here we have downloaded the patent data from the World WIPO patent databases using inventor's name, inventor's name uh, from any of these African countries. So the cumulative growth is says that there is a significant growth after the you know 1995 and the top in 2000 uh, uh, 2013 it is altogether about more than uh, 100 uh, 1200 or more than patent cumulatively coming from the african continent uh, but there is a decline but that may be due to the incomplete coverage of the wipo patent databases many of the african countries uh, uh, national databases may not have been updated in the global citation databases. That is the problem with the developing countries because the developing uh, countries doesn't have the systematic data available uh, to do this kind of analysis. So patent in terms of uh, counting, South Africa has 9,784 uh, patent till now in WIPO databases from the year 1992 to 2019. And Egypt has 2,100 and something like this. These are the you know whole counting. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, among the total 54 uh, African Union member countries, 52 have some kind of publication and listed in the country ranking databases. Some two, three countries doesn't have any publication in the Scopus databases. There is certainly a visible growth in the African scientific publication. It can be seen from the Scopus data that the scientific publication from Africa has increased almost five times from the year 1996 to 2000. 19 and it is this this growth uh, uh, pattern is uh, is more than the global average uh, but however a significant amount of africa literature has not been um, covered by any of the global citation databases for example web of science and scopus so a african centric citation database is the need of that hour to capture the true global picture of african scholarly publications as well as the patent uh, patent uh, productivity in african citation index and is developed by the council for the development of social science research that called codes area but i think that is not a very much fruitful and it cannot be accessible or maybe there is some some problem in that i don't know what it is exactly and like other previous studies among all the african countries south africa rank at the top followed by the egypt in terms of global publication south africa rank 35 position and um, Egypt position is 39. Northern Africa cumulatively produce more number of articles than any, any other region of the Africa and performance of the middle uh, region is at the lowest. In every region, there, is, there are only a few countries which are performing better 
in terms of number of publication or patent and the whole continuous productivity is based on only a few star performer countries citation per documents in african countries are about 10.79 per document that is higher than the east europe and the asia east europe is 8.47 and asia is 10.66 but it is lower than the global average so this is my uh, rough publication because of the time constraint i cannot go into the details thank you very much for giving me the time for this Thank you very much, uh, Swapan, for this uh, presentation. Uh, very interesting also in the light of the fact that we have been trying recently to, to, to look into how um, Africa uh, literature uh, relates to the Africa Leaks, uh, development of the Africa Leaks uh, network and so on. So very interesting to have this as an, as an input to the discussion. We'll be interested in sharing and discussing more with you on that. There was one question to you from Bell at the, in, the, in the chat saying, did you look at co-authorship among African and non-African authors? Could you maybe respond to that as it's so specific? Yes, and, yeah? yes. Uh, yes, yes. Thank you very much. Uh, the, Actually, what we find, and also it has been validated by some other studies, that uh, many of the African countries is uh, collaborating with their their colonizer. It means to say, you can uh, the country which was under their their rule, and also the collaboration is more with the developed countries than the African continent among themselves. So there is a very 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 weak collaboration among the African countries as well as any other developing countries in the global south. Thanks, thanks for this question. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your response. Good to get that uh, noted. And, and uh, that means I can now pass on the floor to Rebecca Hanlin, um, who is an innovation and development specialist in Africa Leaks and based at the African Center for Technology Studies in Nairobi. Uh, also a, uh, related to the, um, to the I group at Olbuk University and and the open university among many other places i'm sure becky <laughs> it's over to you uh, and uh, you will talk about skills and capabilities where are we now thanks margarita and um thanks to uh the presenters uh before me um let's see is this gonna move across yes so I started by going back to the beginning of the book. Um, I, I read uh, this book when I did my PhD in 2005. Um, I, I started my PhD at, at the time. It was obviously uh, recently, recently published. Um, so it was really good to go come back to it because I, I haven't read it uh, in any depth um, in, in recent years. Um, and in the context of this seminar, I was very struck by uh, the emphasis placed in the introductory chapter on nations and states and, and why they matter. And because most of my work at the moment is looking at skills, capabilities building, research capacity building, I was very struck by the, um, the discussion around the relative role of science-based innovation and high technology and R&D versus broader uh, discussions on uh, broader uh, kind of definitions of, of innovation um, and, the, and the importance of national context in determining the type of, of innovation um, that, that countries uh, promote. Um, and another thing that is brought out in the introduction is the need for universities. And this very much follows the, the, the general trend of, of a lot of the, the, de um, the literature that has focused on um, R&D um, and, and the linkages between university and industry. Uh, but as, as Ned mentioned, the fact that actually there's a significant amount of the innovation uh, systems literature that looks at general competence building and the importance of building capabilities um, more broadly uh, and particularly through the role of, of TVET. So, in part three, um, I'm not going to go through all the chapters. Uh, my, my colleagues have done that already, but we, we do have discussions about industry uni um, university relations. There's a lot of discussion about how at the time of writing of the book, there's very weak human resource, there's very weak education and training systems, and that there's the difficulty of linking education and training with industry needs. Um, there's some discussion of regional policies to encourage regional partnerships, 
um, and, and the, the importance of supply ch side challenges to overcome um, uh, through the use of, of taking the, the, um, the skills from elsewhere. Um, so understanding that not everybody has to do everything um, and, and, and uh, train everybody in, in everything. Um, and then there's quite a, a significant focus in, uh, in, in the chapter by Shilin Gu on, on training and education and, and learning in particular. Um, and what she focuses in on, or what I took away from rereading that chapter, um, is the role of international funding and, uh, and the difference between knowledge transfer and, and learning. Um, I, um, I have to say, I've just come back from leave, and one of the problems of, uh, of doing this as soon as you come back from leave is that you do everything too quickly. So I actually thought we were presenting on part four of the book and not part three to start with. So um, the long and the short of it is there's a lot more on skills and capabilities in part four than in part three. Um, and, uh, and so I, I've, I've listed here those, those elements. Um, but there's a lot of similarities, as I say, these issues around uh, university industry linkages, where, uh, what types of skills are required um, and, and, and who, who should be providing them um, uh, is, is all things that, that come up in, in that part as well. Um, and interestingly, there's more discussion in this uh, part around the role of regional research and innovation programs perhaps than even in, in, in part, part three. Um, so in rereading uh, the book or, or parts of the book, uh, it got me thinking about where we are now. I mean, uh, do we have sufficient skills and capabilities in Africa? Um, almost 20 years since the book was published. Um, how fit for purpose is the science, technology and innovation and the R&D system and recognizing that there are, there are you know, still these defined differences in these systems um, in, in much of Africa and whether they really do support skills and capabilities building. What is the situation with university industry linkages and, and what more still needs to be done? Because I think we're all aware that you know, there, things aren't fit for purpose and, and we might not have sufficient skills and capabilities. Um, and recognizing that they're asking the question to myself um, and to us uh, now as to whether there needs to be more done, not just in terms of education and training, which is often where this discussion is focused, but also in terms of other areas of policy that are important, um, particularly to encourage firms to understand the importance of learning and knowledge acquisition. Um, so my, my starting point is, the, uh, is a project that we've just finished, actually Margareta um, and, and I and, and others were involved in the project, is very East Africa focused. Um, so recognizing that different countries and um, different um, regions of, of Africa have different, different situations. But certainly in Kenya, we found that uh, the experience of, in terms of engineering capabilities in renewable electrification and, and renewable energy projects um, sh suggests that things have improved since 2003. Um, so we have the example of Estes, uh, a Danish wind, um, uh, wind turbine manufacturer who has been involved in putting up a, a wind uh, farm in Kenya, was expecting to use uh, foreign engineers well into the operation phase, hasn't had to at all, um, and has been able to, to hire locally, um, locally trained engineers. Um, we have a similar situation uh, and actually a, a much more positive situation in small scale solar PV firms across East Africa. Um, interestingly, many of the firms that we, we interviewed focused on technical training and not university training. We had one uh, director of a firm who was very adamant. He did not want university educated graduates. He wanted those with technical skills and he would prefer to do training on the job. Um, as much as possible. Um, and, and what we've seen is that this training that they uh, and these skills and capabilities that these firms have 
have enabled them when the the projects are right and there is a uh, funding and opportunity for them to to get involved in uh, renewable energy and renewable electrification projects to upgrade and upgrade pretty quickly um, in in some instances um, in in kenya where we we spent a lot of the the time um, on the project um, looking at, at different projects we we find that the Kenyan government has done some um, work to uh, purposefully encourage um, activity. There's now local content rules in the energy sector, which weren't there before, but they haven't necessarily gone as far as Ethiopia, for example, um, where in, in similar projects, particularly large scale um, energy projects, they have insisted that local university engineers work shadow the Chinese engineers during the building of the, of the, of the wind farms and, and the dams um, to purposefully build project management capabilities uh, for use in future projects. Not so much engineering per se, but the project management capabilities. And that, that we found was really important across all our projects. Um, they've also set up the African Railway Academy um, they're, they're putting a lot of investment into railways and they recognize the need to build up skills um, in, in that area. Um, so one of the things, and, and this comes from more part four of the book rather than part three, so I, I won't go into it significantly, but as I say, local content rules are really important, but so too are contracting arrangements that firms have and the degree to which um, the, the types of contracts that, that the firms were involved in um, supported the use of local content and the ability for firms to uh, subcontract others and, and bring in additional, um, additional skills um, to the point where people were not having to, were bringing in specialized skills. And so firms could specialize in particular areas and not um, be expected to do everything. Um, we also found examples, not just in that project, but also in an earlier project that I was involved in, um, of the being involved in, in these large scale projects provided um, the opportunity to build backward linkages and enable uh, firms to actually um, move at, beyond their geographical boundaries and get projects in, in, other, in other countries. Um, so that's one side of the equation where we are with with firms and and that looks pretty rosy um, particularly in this context this specific context of renewable electrification um, and predominantly in in kenya and, and ethiopia but on the other side of the equation you have issues of of, of the education system um, in kenya despite the fact that we have these these um, engineers who uh, are getting really good jobs um, we, we all still complain about the quality of graduates, and rightly so, um, and, and the government has introduced a, a competence-based curriculum recently to try and improve the quality of, um, of education. Um, but things have significantly improved since 2003. Um, so we shouldn't see, uh, we, I think my, what I'm trying to say here is we, we need to take stock of where we are and, and recognize that we have come a long way uh, but we still obviously have, have a long way to go. From a regional perspective, what's really good to see is that we're finally getting some discussion and, and some action um, in terms of building regional uh, centers of excellence um, that encourage cross collaboration between researchers in multiple universities um, and in multiple countries, um, different initiatives. The AU NEPAD have been talking about it for for some time, but have only um, really got, got started on this in the, in the last couple of years. Um, we now have uh, the African Research Universities Alliance, ARUA, um, which is trying to bill itself as the African Russell Group um, that started in, in 2015. And, and they also have their own centers of excellence. But this has to still uh, be put into the broader context as, as others have already pointed out that uh, broadly speaking, Africa is still um, suffering uh, in terms of the amount of funding that is given to R&D um, 
and, and in terms of where we are in terms of outputs, um, scientific output. Um, so um, as, as per the, the last presentation, the issue around uh, publications and, and the degree to which we have a significant level of publications is, um, yeah, is significantly lacking. Um, but uh, one short aside, and I, I don't have a huge amount of time, so I'll, I won't go through this particularly quickly um, uh, in any depth, but we do obviously have to be a bit careful about the metrics that we talk about. Um, and many of us know the, the difficulties of, of just looking at matrix around the number of PhD holders, uh, the relative merits of, of looking at uh, the number of scientific publications, particularly when uh, we need to consider a broader understanding of innovation and the importance of different types of innovation in, um, uh, in, in terms of, of development paths of, uh, of, African, of different African countries. Um, and, uh, and the important role uh, and the increasing recognition that's being given to things like innovation in the informal sector and the, the role of the informal sector in the economy. Um, and, and so it's really nice to see, as, as Neb mentioned, that there is increasing recognition of the need to focus on innovation in TVET training um, establishments um, and not just at, at the university level. Um, I wanted to just touch briefly on the role of research and research funding. Um, the UNESCO science report shows that there is increasing research, uh, government funding in, in R&D in a number of countries, but um, it's, there's still a significant level of funding that comes from outside, from external, um, from external sources. Um, some of the work that I've been doing recently has been focused on science granting councils um, through the Science Granting Councils Initiative. And that's where we've been working with science councils um, in 15 countries. Uh, Nigeria has just been brought on, so it will now be 16 countries uh, across Africa. We see that through that initiative, we've managed to leverage um, government funding, um, African government's funding for research projects but only because we've been able to have international co-funding. And there is still a question about the longevity of that uh, increased government funding when the international co-funding um, stops. But at the moment, we do see a positive signs in, in, uh, in most of the 15 countries that we've been working with, that governments are in, in increasingly interested in, um, in funding research. Um, but we find that that, level of research funding is still significantly lower than that that's coming through international development partners through other funding streams um, and particularly through sectoral line ministries and, and, and goes direct to universities and research centers. There's a big question about the absorptive capacity of universities to manage that funding um, and to go back to a problem that we still have um, that was identified in the book in 2003 that the linkages with the private sector are, are very difficult to make um, and there is a, one of the reasons for this is because of the focus on research funding and not innovation funding um, uh, particularly at the level of science councils and the, and the mandate that science councils have um, so what now? Um, a couple of uh, final slides just to round things up. I think based on my reading or rereading of the book from 2003 and where my experiences of science, uh, skills and capabilities building uh, to date, um, it's really important that we maintain this focus on different types of learning and we recognize uh, and we, we spend more time in thinking about um, learning by doing, using, and interacting, and not just um, through more formal STI. Um, and I think we do need to spend a bit of time thinking about the, the real value of learning by research. Um, and um, particularly, uh, if, if we say that that's important, then how do we link that to other areas of the economy that are, are usually excluded from, um, from discussions with the universities. Um, another set of areas for, for discussion and more attention is obviously funding. 
Um, as I say, the, the differentiation between funding for research and, and innovation. Um, we have some councils that are now splitting that. Um, so taking more of the, the UK model, for example, with different science councils, essentially each with a different set of responsibilities. Um, that, that is perhaps good because it recognizes the difficulty of university industry uh, linkage and the loci of most innovation outside of, uh, of universities. Um, but it increases the disconnect between those really important and, uh, and the uh, actors within the national uh, system of innovation. Um, I think we also need to learn from COVID. Uh, the level of public procurement um, has increased um, as a result of COVID, and, and we need to make sure that we, we try and encourage that to continue. So a number of the councils, science granting councils, have undertaken COVID uh, research uh, funding uh, schemes, um, and we need to we we need to try and increase that level of, of challenge funding um, to remain. Um, okay. In terms of regional Becky, I hope you are wrapping up. Yes, uh, yes. last slide. Um, collaborative training and um, education opportunities. I think there's a role um, for regional um, agencies. Uh, the African Academy of Sciences, the African Association of Universities, but also regional qualification authorities. Um, they're highly important to ensure um, that, that universities can collaborate um, across geographical boundaries. Um, and I think the other thing to think about is the culture of research. Um, and I, I don't know that we will be able to um, increase the... the the focus on research excellence, promotions, publications, versus the need to um, deal with developmental issues um, is still a, a disconnect that, that we need to spend a bit more time on. And I'm going to leave it there uh, in the interest of time. Thanks. Yes, very much so in the interesting uh, interest of time because you've raised a lot of fascinating uh, issues here for discussions. And I hope people will be commenting in the chat. Um, uh, continue to do that, please. Um, we may not have a lot of time uh, uh, for discussions, but then it's good to connect uh, across uh, as you can uh, later. Um, we have a uh, Sheikh, I think, now presenting, right? Um, research from China. And Sig, you have not sent me anything about what you will be talking about, but can you try to limit yourself to max, 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 max 10 minutes, <laughs> please. Um, uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I hope you're, um, I'm audible. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, first of all, uh, let me express my sense of gratitude to Professor Mamamoshi, South African Research Chair, Sarshi Innovation Studies, and Mr. Rajesh for hosting these constructive sessions on the book, Putting Africa First, The Making of African Innovation Systems. And thank you, Chair, for offering me a time slot to share some of my ideas about the peripheral innovation actors, national innovation system, and COVID-19. Uh, well, before, well, a few years back in 2014, I proposed two concept notes to Professor Mamamushi and Professor Saradindu Bahadri, who is my thesis supervisor, and Professor Anga Baskaran, who is editor of Asia Study, chief, uh, chief editor, uh, in a globalist academy at Finland. The first one was for a special issue, specifically to understand the knowledge dynamics and inventiveness of the informal sector. The motivation was to gather nuanced understandings about bottom-up innovations, knowledge appropriation mechanisms, and the informal innovation systems, if any, existing in the informal settings. Uh, the call was circulated in 2014, and the response was overwhelming. And instead of one proposed special issue, we had to incorporate the reviewed papers in two separate issues for AJS study. Both issues culminated in a book with the title Informal Sector Innovation Insights from Global South, which was published by Rutledge, Taylor and Francis in 2015. This edited volume had 15 chapters contributed by 28 researchers from different parts of the Global South. We divided the book into three parts, each dealing with different perspectives about the knowledge rich but economically poor people from the margins. The second proposal was to host Chris Freeman annual lecture series at Center for Studies in Science Policy, Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi. It was a student-led initiative supported by CSSP JNU, JNU, its faculty, and Professor Alan Freeman. We hosted three annual lectures in India, 
The first lecture titled is Chris Freeman's Enduring Contribution to Economics of Innovation was delivered by Professor Mamu in 30, on 31st of July, 2015. Second lecture on intellectual property rights through the lenses of a discourse and development was delivered by Professor Amit Asre on 14th of September, 2016. And third lecture was delivered by Professor Simta Narayan. She was that time at MIT. Again, uh, one of the important objectives was to revisit the work of Professor Freeman, especially uh, and NIS uh, scholarship, uh, and to see if any of this NIS proposed frameworks could be applied to understand the nuanced uh, uh, nuances of the undercurrent innovation moments, which happen organically at the bottom of the economic pyramid. Today, I will briefly revisit Putting Africa First and our co edited book, Informal Sector Innovations Insights from Global South, in light of COVID 19. Uh, my motivation is twofold. Firstly, I think it's of utmost importance that the NIS community has a greater engagement with the concept of frugal grassroots innovations because it's quite simply a predominant mode of innovation and central activity within the socioeconomic functioning in vast swaths of regions across the world. Secondly, we find that frugal bottom-up low-cost innovation has been a vital and rapid response mechanism to COVID-19 pandemic sweeping the world globe. The experiences of frugal innovations and frugal innovators I have gathered during COVID-19 in different parts of India, Afghanistan, and many African countries provide insightful examples of how peripheral innovations can be harnessed as a crisis response on the ground in needy communities. We all know that novel coronavirus, COVID-19, outbreak in late uh, in December 2019 sparked an unprecedented global crisis. More than a year and a half after virus initial emergence, global citizens continue to face adverse economic and health related effects. With more than half of the world's population still under lockdown, COVID-19 has decimated millions of jobs, devoured fragile enterprise, killed thousands and infected millions around the world. Nearly all governments are continuing to grapple with the ramifications of the pandemic. Given the nature, scope, and severity of COVID-19 crisis, unprecedented global responses are required. Yet many scholars uphold that the pandemic response is starkly lacking, primarily due to the ineffective collaboration and policy paralysis. Countries with limited resources and expertise have endured delayed responses to COVID-19 and faced serious consequences. Rich countries, at the same time, with antiquated technology and underfunded healthcare system also struggle to trace positive cases in the early days of virus spread. As a result, all economies, respective of size and advancement, have faced pandemic related consequences. The discussions resonated in the book Putting Africa First and the works of innovation system theorists, most notably of Professor Freeman, Professor Lundwall, offer a glimmer of hope in these gloomy times. NIS scholarship informs us that economic prosperity, social inclusion, and environmental sustainability can be achieved with robust pro-innovation institutions, vibrant actor sector collaborations, and with proper incentives. The works of 26 innovation scholars combined together in putting Africa first also tell us that efficiency in terms of economic prosperity, fairness in terms of opportunities, and environmental sustainability can be achieved with what Professor Sachs elsewhere calls as compassionate innovation systems. Poverty, hunger, rising inequality, disease and climate change like threats can be lessened if innovations both market creating as well as non-market driven innovations are allowed to grow without any political or economic bias. Certainly there are ample evidences documented in the economic history of various nations, which reveals that, un, you know, un, that unprecedented wealth and nation's prosperity has come to us because of what Professor McCloskey calls as innovationism. The interaction of geography, technology, and institutions and cultures, according to Professor Sachs, Professor Christensen, Professor Joel Mokher, and Professor David Lendis, has lifted billions of the people around the world out of extreme poverty traps. No doubt innovation has given us power, wealth, and prosperity. Yet, as flagged by Professor Freeman in his guest remarks in Putting Africa First book, that the direst poverty, the cruelest burdens of disease, of armed conflict, and environmental disasters still ravage Africa. Not only Africa, poverty and disease is perverse now. Professor Freeman further upholds that technology alone cannot yield its potential benefits unless appropriate cooperative social initiatives are organized by Africans and for the Africans. To put it differently, a push down innovation and growth model should be discouraged. For my research on informal sector innovations and regional development, I have profited enormously from the works of NIS scholarship, 
including the works of Professor Freeman, Professor Lindwall, Professor Momo, and Professor Peter. They have wonderfully attempted to offer many working models and have gathered many interesting insights aimed to lift people from the margins. Many things in the book about innovation systems, capabilities, and regional developments in the global South context have been written so illuminatingly that a scholar of regional development can overlook this work at his or her own risk. Having said that, some models suggested in the book merit a rethink. For instance, the dominant role of the state in the whole innovation system needs, probably needs a critical consideration. We are increasingly informed about the creationist view about innovations that with government funding, intelligent men at the top can engender new innovations. The excessive and uncritical focus on entrepreneurial state as a sole source of innovation needs further scrutiny. State in China, Korea, and Japan no doubt is instrumental in creating a vibrant innovation systems, but the relationship between peripheral innovation actors and the states in African and other developing countries is broken and very weak. In many cases, it is the state which is killing the growth of organic bottom-up innovation systems. Further, history of inventions is dotted with hundreds of examples which demonstrate that state and basic science were little to the great enrichment which humans have witnessed. Importantly, as journalist Matt Ridley in his book, How Innovation Works, would inform us that the sprawling empires and imperial spaces collapsed because they created bureaucratized disinnovation systems. To put it differently, government-led mission-oriented directionality needs probably a rethinking. It may work in advanced economies, but the case of majority of the global South countries is radically different. Most of the inventive activities happen outside the government radars, and majority of the workforce is engaged in informal settings. For instance, 94% of the workforce in India is engaged in the informal settings. In our more than a decadal ethnographic research and informal sector innovations in different parts of India, I, along with my thesis supervisor, Dr. Saradindu Bahaduri, have observed that many government attempts to formalize the informal sector had counterproductive results. A bottom-up innovator's perspective is missing in all elite innovation manuals. Second, the increasing focus on basic science, R&D, patents in Global South will continue to miss the important non-R&D-driven, non-patented innovations. The FEMS journal purpose technology, the steam engines, as we all know, led to the understanding of thermodynamics and not the way around. Powered flights preceded almost all aerodynamics. It would be a blunder if we continue to overlook non-university fortified spaces as no innovation zones. For equity and inclusion, the folks necessarily should also shift from formal to the non-formal sector. Third, incentives like IPR, intellectual property rights, to encourage innovations, probably in global south you know, context, uh, we, is a continuous problem. You know, rewarding patents to big MNCs we have recently seen during the ongoing pandemic has blocked vaccine access to bottom billions. People are not only gasping for air in our settings, but are also desperately looking for vaccines. NIS scholars should on priority work on some alternative incentives to nurture inclusive and sustainable innovation models suited to the requirements of Global South. If it is not done on priority, then probably we will continue living in the innovation famine period rather than expecting any innovation feast in, in the Southern context. Further, you know, new innovation approaches dedicated to frugality and demilitarization of the economy need to be explored. Circular economy, bricolage-driven innovation models need to be investigated and encouraged. Importantly, permissionless innovation systems, user-driven innovation systems need to be re-examined in a post-COVID paradigm. New innovation pathways like frugal, low-cost innovations and secondary innovations can be experimented. Since short cycle innovation models, as Professor Lee would argue, does not require much resources and the focus is on basic science, investigate in your investing in engineering rather than building on research base would yield quick and desired results. Creative imitations with frugal values, as Professor Shabha Wu would suggest, could offer new windows of opportunities for countries with poor infrastructure and less resources. Fifth and important, you know, politics of innovation has attracted scant attention both in NIS scholarship and the book, Putting Africa First. In fact, in our edited volume, we also failed to incorporate this debate. It would be interesting to re-examine the politics behind new ideas, the politics that new ideas could engender and the politics which dampens new ideas needed a look. The debate around techno-nationalism demands our urgent attention. I have gathered many examples of innovations from troubled political spaces wherein I have firsthand observed 
that politics plays a dominant role in nurturing and stemming new ideas. In such disturbing, disturbed, politically disturbed settings, ideas are sifted according to the requirements of certain interest groups. This selection-based innovation regime dampens the left out innovators. As a result, a dysfunctional innovation system is created. And lastly, I think the innovation favorites approach should be discouraged. As suggested by Professor Edmund Felfers, the 2006 Nobel laureate, you know, mass flourishing of innovations with the dynamism for mass indigenous innovation should be the approach. You know, all sectors and sources of innovation need to be encouraged and studied. While we are all battling COVID-19 and all formal structures are shaking, I'm very optimistic that NIS scholarship will continue to instill a sense of hope and will continue finding new, sustainable, inclusive, equitable, and compassionate innovation systems. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sheikh, for that fascinating uh, uh, critique of the role of the state and, and for bringing so much emphasis to the informal sec importance of the informal sector and bottom-up uh, innovation issues. I thought that was uh, really uh, good and provocative and interesting. Um, Bal has posted also something on, on, the, on, on your, um, your uh, presentation in the chat, so maybe you want to respond to that. Emmanuel Odio is our last presenter for today. And um, Emmanuel is an academic at the University of Witzwaterrand, Johannesburg, South Africa. And uh, as you introduced yourself, you are an ardent believer in Africa and her future. We really look forward to, to hearing uh, what is behind that statement now. Emmanuel, yeah. over to you. Yeah, thanks so very much. Uh, um, can you confirm I have 10 minutes for a little more? Uh, you have no, absolutely no more than 10 minutes. <laughs> uh, so please, please, yeah. No problem. So um, for this particular presentation, I'm actually reflecting on um, what the previous um, scholars have actually said, especially with respect to the chapters in the book that we're actually speaking to. And I am making an argument based on my reflection as an African researcher, working in multidisciplinary contexts, and also reflecting on the fact that there are two major shocks that we are currently experiencing globally irrespective of either we are in the global south or we're in the global north. And that is the case of COVID-19 pandemic and the threat of climate change. And, you know, these are the four chapters which actually speak to, you know, putting Africa first. And these four chapters actually speak to regional innovations, innovation system and regional experiences. And you know, the work of Mario Scary actually resonates very strongly with me. And as, as I said earlier, I'm, I'm going to be sharing my thoughts based on my reflection as a researcher and specifically working in Africa. And, and I feel very strongly that some of the ideas I'll be reflecting on also from the, from the book itself will be very useful for our discussion. A comment made by as scary um, around regional innovation systems was more or less reflecting on the historical perspective of the weaknesses of the national innovation systems. And the argument the author made was the need for a regional innovation system. And on the basis of this, um, what I'm actually doing is to reflect on what the author has said. The first thing is around the, the involvement of government, especially in research and development, which, I mean, quite a number of the other speakers have actually alluded to. And the second thing, especially Rebecca alluded to this very strongly, is around the importance of knowledge. Because, I mean, there is no way we can talk about the regional innovation systems without knowledge in the, in the context. And the other link, I mean, my, I mean, part of what actually was also, and I'm drawing from the book section, is the importance of human capital investment and the need for us in Africa to transform, uh, to transition beyond just the national innovation systems. And the author in that particular chapter was, you know, drawing on uh, um, a successful, and I would say it's actually successful in a part in Shetty, 
um, even that, that came in, in in the year 2001. Drawing further, my argument is that even though the five authors, I mean, re, they wrote this particular chapter 18 years ago, and they, I mean, they contributed quite extensively to the regional voices, I argue for a quadruple helix model. And a quadruple helix model that actually draws very strongly on science, on policy, on industry and society. And I'm saying this because, I mean, I feel very strongly that in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic and the fact that globally we are faced with the, the, the impact of the climate change, even including on Africa, it is important for us to go beyond what, the triple helix model. So, so I am actually taking the argument beyond the triple helix uh, model, which has consistently focused on government, on, on universities and, and businesses. And I'm, and, and I'm saying, that it's actually important for us to look at the society as a critical stakeholder. So science, policy, industry, and society for regional innovation systems in Africa is exactly what I'm actually arguing for. So if you observe, I'm taking things from more of a, a, a conceptual framing than going into micro issues. If, if I look at the, the four chapters and reflect about where we are on the continent, especially with the, the two global shocks I shared with you earlier. It is important that as, as, as regional innovation systems on Africa, we need to actually work around knowledge hubs. And part of what we need to be able to do, especially now, is also to strengthen the regulatory framework that we have in Africa, which will, also, which will include inclusive migration policies. Because one thing we have to understand is that within the continent, there is the need for us to have a cross-fertilization of ideas. And I know Professor Mamo has consistently argued for these, I mean, over time. The other idea I want to bring in is the importance of indigenous knowledge systems. Because indigenous knowledge systems will actually link the university industry society collaborations or partnership. And it is important for us to emphasize the importance of knowledge in this particular relationship. So in conclusion, what I'm actually saying is that as Africans, as Africans living in Africa or as researchers in the global North interested in working in Africa, either we are resident here in Africa or not, it is important for us to think of a partnership model where universities, the government, industry, and the society are consistently working hand in hand, especially now through the pandemic and in the post-pandemic, whenever that is. It is important for us to also consider very strongly inclusive government policies. And these inclusive government policies will actually make sure that we're able to draw on knowledge across the continent, we're able to draw on the expertise within the continent, and we are also able to at least generate enough, enough um, relationship or enough partnership for us to actually build on, on the continent. So that's my talk for now. Um, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to present, and I'm open to questions. Thank you very much. Thanks, Chair, and thanks, audience. Thank you very much for being so brief and to the point with your presentation. And, and I love your emphasis on the partnership issues, which I, I do think um, is, is very a very strong point. I remember also one time presenting the, 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 the triple helix model in, a, in an African context with some good colleagues at the University of uh, Dar es Salaam. And one of the participants actually went up and drew a, a line around the triple helix uh, elements and said, okay, so Margaret, this is society. How about taking that into a consideration? It was a good learning exercise <laughs> and really making it visible that not all actors are formal. Uh, there are lots of informal actors that we need to take into account as well. So we have a few minutes now, uh, about uh, 12 minutes before we kind of have to close. And I want to reserve the last uh, few minutes, five minutes or so, or five, uh, three to five minutes for Mamo. But before that, we have a possibility to, to uh, take up a few of the questions in the chat. 
uh, and or uh, an open discussion. So is there any, um, I think there have been some discussions here raised about the state, the role of the state, which could be interesting as one uh, theme uh, to, to ponder on. Uh, also, the other uh, theme that has really come out very clearly is the need to balance uh, both academic work and capabilities with uh, or university work with the more practical and uh, STI uh, learning and, and doing. So these are at least two of the issues that I think have come up and which have become very interesting. Um, anybody, I can't really see everybody here, but is there anybody who would like to to kind of uh, kick something off here? Uh, I can see somebody is active in the chat right now. Who is that raising Muller? Who is that? Andrew. So Andrew, let's hear from you. What are you, you are, you're back to Jens Muller. Is that right? I wonder if you could give me a Is that Andrew? Is, is that your question? A question oh, okay. about. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's, it, this might be hard, but um, I wonder about the local state. If uh, if they have he has the same appreciation of the, the municipal actors in in relation to innovation, especially the endogenous or or, or indigenous systems of innovation and especially in the more informal sector. Um, that would be my uh, question. If the state is yeah. homogeneous or if we let there's a difference on the local level. Yeah. And I think that makes a direct line actually back to our very first presenter today to Stephen, uh, Stephen uh, your, your presentation for the UK, because also there we see many different issues here. Um, Stephen, do, would you want to comment on that and before we give the floor to, to Sik? Yeah, I think I think it's important to distinguish between uh, <laughs> the different state actors because uh, traditionally the local state was very important in uh, a number of the industrial centres in the UK, and we had what people have termed municipal socialism in terms of uh, infrastructure, both cultural and 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 physical, and support for for local businesses. Mm. And uh, it, I think one thing in industrial, I think. Uh, Business and industry historians have a lot, a, a lot to contribute when they talk about the use of interlocking directorships to transfer knowledge uh, and learning between uh, ostensibly competing firms, but also between you know the, the financial backers and, and the firms and the and the actual technical side of things. It's quite an interesting interlocking relationships, and the local state is important in that. But I think that what we're seeing now is the local entrepreneurial state that because there's been so many cuts in in funding in the UK that. The local state is now having to, to literally invest in, in local activity uh, in order to develop an income stream which formerly came from central government. So the, the state is actually becoming involved in, 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 in the local economy in a very different way. Hmm. And I and, guess one other thought and, just is that very often we're talking about innovation at, at you know, the highest, most technical levels of, uh, um, uh, of innovation, but of course that those innovations filter down in, into the foundation economies as well, and they transform more mundane economic activities, uh, as, as we've seen with, with e-commerce and so forth, quite small businesses mm -hmm. are now having to be savvy. So I think it's, a, it's quite a complex in, interaction with the different levels of state and mm -hmm. between the different uh, local and regional actors. For sure. And and maybe here there's uh, also a link to the devolution uh, activities going on in a country like Kenya, where where uh, counties have been taking over more um, more uh, responsibilities and so on. Becky, I don't know whether you want to come in, but there's also uh, a link to, to the, what Ned was talking about, I think, in terms of the um, local innovation opportunities actually being changed because of the technologies and the digitalization in general. So so some new opportunities coming up here. Any of you guys who want to come in on some of these issues? Ed, Becky? Um, so no, I, I just uh, said exactly that in, in the chat. Ah, um, sorry, devolution. I didn't <laughs> No, it's fine. Uh, you said it as I was typing it. Um, devolution <laughs> has, uh, you know, the issues of, of sub-national level, particularly when, when countries devolve uh, power, um, as we've seen in Kenya, has led to some very interesting um, situations, both uh, opportunities for more localized innovation opportunities, but also um, a, a set of 
very different power struggles and um, uh, and potentially more people losing out um, uh, in in some situations. Um, so Bal's earlier comment of of taking into account the the changes in the political uh, dynamics um, of of innovation systems um, since two thousand and three with with these various different changes, both at, um, both in terms of the way governments manage, but also the way um, education systems are, have have changed over time are, are really important. Can I raise a, a point, uh, Margaret? Sure, Radia. Yeah, I think the, it's important to emphasize on skills and training. I think my, my understanding getting into firms, and it's not necessarily because firms are better endowed, having lots of money to, to not just buy uh, robots and drones, but to internalize and produce them because a lot of them requires firm-specific adaptations. I think the kind of training we're talking about is, uh, to a large extent, quite different from simply getting into mechatronics or precision engineering and so on. How do you then bring in coding? How do you then uh, uh, internalize these kinds of things so that a lot of it is cognitive, uh, judgmental, which often requires that people are thinking about how to mass customize things, uh, appropriating both scale and scope economies. Now, I've been observing that, that in firms. I first saw that in Japan and, and Taiwan in the firm, and it's now happening in Indonesia and Malaysia, although, of course, it's not um, a widespread. And my own feeling is um, these are not rocket science sort of skills the way I've looked at it, and I think um, uh, least developed countries get, can get involved. It's just like the firms I visited in Kenya, Uganda, and so on. I was telling them that a lot of these British machines they were using are simply obsolete, but they were just required to buy them because of the kind of aid they were enjoying from these countries. And not only that they are cheaper, but also they're multi-capable, lighter, and then it's easier to handle. Thank you very much, Radia. And uh, Ned, you wanted to come in as well? Uh, you're muted, sorry. I guess, well, one, one comment. Um that actually it could be a query for, for Rebecca to see what she thinks. But I think, um, yeah, I think the digital technology is opening up new, new possibilities. And if the extent to which that might be linked to some sort of devolution is an interesting issue that I don't know much about. I suppose I would ask Rebecca and Kenya, we, we know about the innovation hubs and the uh, dynamics of um, digital entrepreneurship are qu often quite impressive. Is this being, encouraged and fostered in some way by the, um, the, the changes in the constitution which in Kenya, which called for more devolution. I guess the other this quick point on the more general question of um, TVET, uh, vocational training, I just wanted to make the point that also it's, it's a question of inclusiveness. Firms may need it, they do need it, I believe, but it also provides opportunities because we need to keep in mind that even in the most developed countries, it is extremely unusual that more than 50% of the relative age group that goes to universities does go to universities. Um, I know of only two countries where it goes over 50%. So what about the people who don't go? That's 50% of the population. They need to have opportunities for careers, for career paths and for um, secure incomes. And one way to doing that is to develop your TVET system. So I would say there's an inclusive argument that comes, that can be linked to the um, competency building and, and argument. Yeah. That's all. Thank you very much, Ned. And very appropriately, Sheik has uh, raised his hand because you kicked off a lot of discussion here about the role of the state and so on. So I'll give the floor to you. And uh, and then after that, I think we'll have to, uh, I'll have to give it to, to Mamo for, for a brief wrap up, unless there's any of the speakers that I have not asked if they wanted to come in. But Sheik, please. Yeah, uh, first I want to respond to um, uh, Professor Andrew's comment that is there any role of the subnational, uh, the state governments in scaling up uh, non-formal innovations? You know, I have been studying these non-formal innovations in India from more than 15 years. And, you know, based on the experiences I had with these innovations, the problems they have flagged are mostly, you know, the bureaucratized invented problems. So that is the way where these innovations, you know, fail to scale up further their innovations. Uh, 
And recently, you know, uh, you know, when COVID hit the world, uh, formal structures crumbled. So we tried to do an experiment. We we sought ideas from the non-formal sector, like you know how you know we were looking for ventilators and uh, PPE kits, and we put a challenge of one lakh uh, Indian currency uh, rupees. It was an open innovation challenge. And mostly, you know, we gathered 200 ideas from the informal sector oh. innovators. And, you know, they designed the ventilators, PPE kits. And some of the ventilators, you know, they were evaluated by doctors and research scientists from Harvard Medical School. And they said, you know, uh, there's no compromise with the technical efficiency of the ideas. The only thing was, you know, we failed to translate those ideas to uh, hospitals and to the healthcare workers in India was precisely because of the, you know, institutions set by the government. You know, they they had to go for different forms of trials. They had to meet certain protocols, and you know, which delayed the whole process of translating these innovations to the healthcare workers. And it was true for PPE kits as well. And uh, the other, you know, problem which these innovators are facing is the kind of incentives which are uh, crafted by bureaucrats and the policymakers. And when there is a regime change, the whole process changes. For example, in India. You know, till we had Congress government till 2014, 2013, you know, the focus was on inclusive innovations and government of India had launched many policies. You know, uh, India was the first country in the world to have crafted such pro grassroots innovation policies in India. But after the regime change, when we have Narendra Modi led government, you know, the folks from inclusive innovation has drastically shifted to market creating innovations. And as a result, the whole, you know, uh, space for non-formal innovations, which was created during the Congress regime, uh, has somewhere, you know, uh, eroded. Uh, but the non-local actors, you know, the non-state actors, for example, the charity organizations, uh, the people who fund, you know, who are not part of government, but fund these local innovations, you know, they are very active. And it is they who create meaningful interventions and who create, you know, uh, value for these uh, low-cost innovations. Uh, this is what we have uh, witnessed in in case of india and so are the examples which have been which we have documented in our book which we coded with professor momo and professor angabaskar and professor bahaduri you know the same issues are being faced by innovators in african uh, context as well i'm not saying government is a problem government uh, of course you know that is a dominant actor in the whole innovation uh, system framework you know we can't create a parallel government or we can't go against the interests of the government but what we're trying to look is, you know, if we can probably co-create, if the bottom of innovators narrative is endorsed by the government, then probably a meaningful platform will be created for both the innovators and for the government and for the people who get benefit out of those innovations. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. And yes, uh, a more nuanced view on the state, I think is actually what is, is required in all respects. I think sometimes some those of us coming from the Nordic welfare states, we tend to be bloody naive, sorry to be very frank, but we, we sometimes are. So uh, it's good to get a critical- Just one interjection, Margaret, sorry. Sorry? The, the four chapters that we dealt with, the two people who discuss East Asia, uh, Shulingu and, and and Amston are telling us to focus on what good did government do there. Um, yeah. Perhaps we should not forget that, yeah. No, exactly. I mean, so governments can do good and governments can do really, really, really bad, right? And and we need a, a nuanced uh, view on these things. I can see Diran is commenting in the that he fully agrees that there has to be a third Agreed. way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, with the sciences and so on to, yeah. But they need to not dominate. Okay, it's time for me to give the floor to Mamo for uh, a brief uh, wrap up and final comments. Okay. And thanks Thank to you. everybody else. Uh, yes. Over from, from me here. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can I? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hello? Loud and loud yes. and clear. Loud okay. and clear. Very very good. I must congratulate all of you. Actually, I mean uh, Margaret also very much. Uh, I call you Sunshine. So uh, you you shined very well. Very good uh, uh, chairing of the sessions and managing all, everything at the time. Thank you very much. <laughs> and uh, but I also would like all the panel gave us uh, brought new ideas from different research areas they have been doing, but linked it to the African uh, context. And I also like on the chat our. Uh, uh, wonderful uh, uh, brotherly professor 
Bal, all of you also commented really well and nicely. And it's a very wonderful discussion. I, I really think we need to learn from each other. And really, we must continue to do this. But the Africa challenge is uh, just a few things I want to just add. Can Africa learn rather than imitate or mimic from Europe, from Asia, from Latin America, all right, from all other parts of the world, what has happened? For example, from China, there's a lot we could learn. China now has eradicated poverty. Can you imagine? It has become a rock star. America has over 30 million people in America are poor. China has nothing now. Now, how did they manage with all the problems they went through? They have done success. What can we learn from that? What can Africa learn? In Africa, as uh, my uh, brother Emmanuel, Dr. Emmanuel said, all the relationships of quadruple helices don't function well. Each of them are separate and also they do different things. The governments are not really working to serve the people. They always fight. Now we just heard for Guinea, they just uh, had a coup d'etat. I mean, you still have all these problems in Africa. We have serious challenges. We still have illicit financial flows flowing out of Africa. We, we have huge amount of, a lot of the, the, the money for the, Fre the, the French speaking part is, in Fre is run by French banks, not Africans. How can the Africans run their economy and develop, create innovation or anything like that if they are not running their own, they, even the, they don't even run their own currency. I think we have a challenge. Africa, uh, we do need very strongly uh, to create your voice goes, uh, goes hard a new innovation theory on. of social capital is very, very necessary. Okay, okay, okay. Sorry, sorry. No, no, all I'm simply saying is that uh, Africa, we have serious challenges and we need, we, although we wrote the book, Putting Africa First, and we had some new ideas, we do need to develop even further to make sure that all the, the, the actors that are engaged in uh, the innovation sphere actually do it properly. Not just uh, say, let's do innovation at every level, at every region, at a local level, at the firm level, at the technology level, or anything like that. We do need some new approach where we can bring together everyone. Something like that is missing in Africa. And I think we do need a, 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 a genuinely, uh, uh, an Africa, Africa needs to create a new smart, integrated, sustainable African innovation system to make Africans own Africa and prevent huge wealth from flowing out of Africa. We need something like that. And Africa has to unite by creating a system of innovation that can remove poverty, unemployment, and inequality. Quality. Um, and Africa must know how to create also what the, the, the Norwegians create, the sovereign wealth fund, something like that, to make sure that the huge resource Africa has with the innovation. I think the innovation side is innovation to liberate Africa, innovation to create justice in Africa. I, I think we need and to create innovation to unite Africa and innovation, innovation to make Africa own its wealth and innovation to know how to relate with others. In other words, with the former colonial powers, how do you relate with them? With also new actors that are coming, how do you relate with them? Without losing, but without also exploiting others. How do we create this new culture and new tradition and new approach? And this new innovation ideas, this philosophically, we need to really go beyond, beyond just the practical sides. And I think this innovation is important. I think if we build working together like this, the area, the innovation area should be really uh, better, the, the world knows it. So that I think some of our big uh, innovate, innovators can also uh, win uh, the Nobel Prize, everything like that. We should make it like that. We should really build it together. Let's together work together all the time, create as a community and really uh, achieve something very, very good to make sure innovation actually makes a difference in the world we are now. And I, my suggestion is just a, uh, just a little suggestion that let's go for it. Thank you very much. I Thank appreciate you. you all. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mamo. Thank you. And I think this uh, this makes means that our <laughs> session today has Thank is you. coming to a, a, an end. Can I encourage everybody to put on their cameras and just wave goodbye <laughs> to each other?
I mean, as I said in the chat, this is the only and, good thing that COVID has brought. It's and I uh, think, the chance to see people more often. <laughs> I think. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Can, can, can you take pictures? Because I can see Bal okay. there. So I, yes, I, yes. I want a picture with Bal. <laughs> yeah, we can all, right. all be together. <laughs> <laughs> Dick, we should all be together <laughs> you have your hand hand up uh, do you want to say something oh no okay good <laughs> so now there's a good nice picture. to see you That's nice to nice see you to see all you. and uh, have That's a great wonderful. evening and see you next same, time yeah. right good thank you, you so all. much nice. lovely to see you from all of bye bye. Bye. thank you bye. thank you everybody bye. nice to see everybody bye 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 Bye. Bye bye. My Raji. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Margaret, great, great sharing. Bye bye. Yeah, right. yeah. Steve, uh, we need. Yeah. To, can we chat a bit later? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Emmanuel. <laughs> I'll send you, shall I send you a link? Or thank you. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Thank everybody. you so much. Yeah. Great. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. It, it, Steve, I, what is this happening with this United Nations? In, Summit. Yeah, I've, I don't. I've see, got... I don't see in the program. What's the problem? What is the? Oh uh, well, <laughs> I didn't see Rajesh in you. Huh? Uh, well, good point, maybe, but we'll see. Um, we've got. We. I've I've got a colleague uh, tied up, an Indian colleague tied up, but I think we, another colleague I haven't got hold of. So we need to uh, have a look and see if there's any spaces that we need to fill. Certainly, we we can give an, another overview of the of the program once we've got responses from everybody uh, okay okay oh i see because yeah. i do i don't i didn't see rajesh and you but i saw uh, Baskaran is there others are there you, yeah i was i was, I, I was I, uh, a number of you were not there i was just yeah. i was I just surprised in, well, they send it to me today okay well i'll 